Yeah, uh, welcome everybody. It's early in the morning, but the sun is shining at least. Uh, so I keep it uh, simple, relaxed, also this talk, so that you get into the day in a relaxed way. So what I'm going to talk about is uh, our experiments on lithium cesium. So uh, we are back now to the molecular species and the search for uh, large dipole moments. What uh, I want to start with is just list some of the points why we think that these ultra-cold molecules are very important, in particular if you look at the uh, wonderful progress that's been made with atoms, and in particular, as we heard also on this conference, on atoms with large uh, magnetic dipole moments. So there's many things that are very similar. Uh, you can trap them over long times. That's a very important issue. Uh, they have a rich internal structure. Uh, some people see this as a disadvantage, uh, in particular myself when I started this. I mean, more than two levels was, uh, was something like a, a real problem, but now I start more and more to appreciate this. They can be now prepared into f uh, specific quantum states with full control over all degrees of freedom. That's a wonderful development of the last, let's say, five years. And they have these long-range electric dipolar interactions, and that's probably one of the major driving forces in this field. And if you look at uh, these different uh, properties of these systems, then you can identify four major areas that are currently covered. The one we heard about already, uh, that's the area of many-body quantum physics, dipolar gases, uh, things like that. Uh, there's lots of interesting proposals. I mean, this is certainly not exhaustive lists of all people that contributed to these proposals. Of course, quantum information is a big driving force still, although some people now call this quantum simulators, but uh, it's more or less uh, the same uh, people sometimes. Uh, quantum chemistry, that's something I want to touch a little bit more in my talk that hasn't been touched so far. So this is going towards a new kind of chemistry at very, very low temperatures and something that only very few people are actually courageous enough to uh, attack, maybe Dave is one of them, is indeed metrology because these systems offer wonderful opportunities to do very, very precise measurements and, for example, to look how fundamental constants might change uh, with time. So in this uh, graph here has meanwhile really become somehow like the legacy of this field. This is taken from this uh, focus issue on ultra-cold molecules, Lincoln Carl Junier were the editors and wrote a wonderful, uh, with other, uh, Dave was also one of the courses, uh, wonderful introduction. And this graph just summarizes uh, uh, the different uh, phase-based densities and the different ap applications that you can have at different phase-based densities. So here's the logarithm of the temperature of the density, and you see that there's a vast uh, 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 variety now of different techniques that can be used to enter different regimes of the phase-based density. And here you can see many of the applications that I just mentioned. Of course, the highest phase-based densities are required for dipolar gases and uh, also partly quantum information processing. But you can already do at these, uh, let's say, more uh, limited phase-based densities some interesting in investigations towards uh, for example, collisional physics or precision measurements. Okay, and so uh, there's now an ever-increasing number of people that uh, are capable of creating molecules in the lowest uh, states, ultra -core molecules in the lowest states, raw vibrational states. There had been enormous progress in the last five years. I just listed here some of the things. Uh, so you can uh, do femtosecond pulses and optically pump molecules into lower states once you have created them, for example, by photo association. Of course, there's all these different activities on Feschbach association, uh, followed by stir-up techniques, which now cover more and more molecules. And I'm, so, I'm sure that soon we'll also hear about uh, sodium potassium here, uh, seeing the enormous progress that has been made just recently. Martin Zwierlein was talking about that. And uh, I should also mention that uh, there had been very important previous work by several groups in this area to uh, put the foundations that, are, that made it possible to actually reach the level of control that we have these days. So uh, for uh, our purposes here, of course, the important molecules are potassium rubidium, the uh, GILA group here, the uh, uh, rubidium cesium, the Innsbruck group, uh, first of we'll certainly talk about this more in detail today, and then there's lithium cesium, that's the molecule that we found interesting. So here is uh, a graph which shows why we are interested in these particular molecules. This is the, uh, elect this is the dipole moment in Dubai as a function of the vibration state that you excite, and you see that lithium cesium has the largest dipole moment, but of course there's other species, rubidium cesium is also one Dubai. Potassium rubidium is, is, is smaller, half a Dubai. And one of the things that one has to also, sorry, one of the things that one has to also bear in mind, it's probably hard to see here, 
uh, but uh, what this shows here is the electric field and the dipole moment as a function of the electric field. So in order to uh, have these dipole moments, take full advantage of these dipole moments, you have to apply significant fields. For example, for lithium cesium, if you apply a field of 20 uh, kilovolts per centimeter, so that's still something that you can do, is uh, you reach something like a few dBi, 4 dBi, but it still hasn't reached its full uh, stationary value. Here it's potassium rubidium, you need lower fields. Here's rubidium cesium, so at 10 kilovolts per centimeter, you reach this 1 dBi. Uh, dipole. So you need electric fields to control the dipole moment. And this is also a positive thing, of course, you can use it to control the dipole moment. So uh, how did we create the uh, molecules? So what we did is photo association. So we started with a pair of uh, free atoms. We excited it to a bound state. Uh, in this state, case, it was a B-single pi state. And then we just relied upon spontaneous emission into a lower state here in the ground state, either in the singlet or in the triplet state. And uh, the experiment uh, that we did is this experiment that we had in Freiburg at that time, we did the double oven, Zeeman slower, and then we trapped the atoms in a double mod, uh, or a, even a dipole trap. And then we put in this photo association laser, and uh, the detection of the molecules was done by uh, ionization, photoionization, resonant enhanced photoionization. So this also gives us access to the internal degrees of freedom of the molecules. So with this technique, we can directly determine what, are, what is the state distribution in our sample. So and then we need an ion detector here in a special configuration. And this is some very early uh, measurements which just showed that this ion detector had to have some special properties in order to distinguish lithium cesium from cesium because the masses are not that much different. OK, so then there was uh, two possible routes. One route was just rely upon photosociation using a specific state here, V equals 26. And there you mainly populate high lying uh, ground states, so high vibration states in the ground state. But you can also choose another. Uh, state here, the V equals 4 state of this B singlet pi. And then the interesting thing is 25% of the uh, initial population uh, actually decay into the vibrational ground state of lithium cesium. So that was a great uh, transition. So we uh, photo associated the molecules via this transition. And indeed, when we did the measurements by the uh, resonance enhanced multi photon ionization, we could indeed find signatures of these raw vibrational ground state molecules in the sample. So uh, by this photo association technique, indeed, you can create samples of um, all molecules in the raw vibrational ground state. The densities are still rather small, and the temperatures are in the typical temperature regime that you would have in the magneto optical trap because this temperature is just transferred to the sample. So the first thing that we wanted to know is what is the dipole moment? Is, it, is the prediction right of this dipole moment? So we uh, did a measurement where we applied an electric field and we looked how our line is shifting <coughs> as a function of the electric field. And it was nice to see, in fact, that the dipole moments that we measured for two different vibrational states, and this is two points here on this graph, that these two dipole moments perfectly match uh, the predictions that had been done by Miraima and Olivier de in 2005. So indeed, uh, uh, lithium cesium has this 5.5 dBi <coughs> dipole moment. So then the next thing we wanted to do is we wanted to investigate these samples over a longer time period. So we went on to have a dipole trap. In our case, that was a CO2 laser dipole trap, 100 watts focused to, to a focus size of, uh, say, 100 micron or a bit more. And then we could trap the molecules in this trap. So this is typically here 5,000 molecules at densities of 10 to the 8 or 10 to the 9 molecules per cubic centimeter. And if you look at this decay curve here, where we fitted two lines to that. First, we thought uh, we can ignore collisions among the molecules. Uh, but that was a little bit too uh, naive. As it turns out, uh, if you just take a pure exponential decay, it doesn't fit the curve as well as if you also include inelastic molecule molecule collisions that, in fact, you expect already at these kind of densities. So we see a slight change here in the decay due to the fact that we have also inelastic molecular collisions at typical rate constants, rate coefficients that are of the order of 2 times 10 to the minus 10 cubic centimeters per second. So that was what we saw. And then the next question we had is we have this large dipole moment. So how does this large dipole moment interact with the surrounding uh, radiation field? So either by spontaneous emission uh, or by uh, interaction with black body radiation. Actually, uh, these kind of investigations were somewhat inspired by uh, experiments that had been done much earlier at the uh, storage ring, also in Heidelberg, where the people measured these kind of decays for HD, for the simplest of uh, the molecules. And so the 
dipole moment is large, and it turns out that also, uh, if you look at the vibration spacing, the vibration spacing matches uh, quite well already with the spectrum of the black body radiation uh, that uh, is, of course, surrounding the whole system all the time. So the question was, uh, can we observe any kind of processes due to uh, black body radiation, and can we observe the spontaneous decay of vibration states due to the emission of uh, infrared photons? So uh, you can then do some simple calculations just based on the uh, A coefficient here, where what enters is the hoehner london factor and the transition matrix elements. Uh, you can then also look at the coupling to the black body radiation, as you can find in any textbook. And then you can come up with some numbers. Uh, so this is rotational redistribution rates for uh, V equals 0 at temperatures of uh, room temperatures. It's hard to read, but I will tell you that these rates are typically of the order of 10 to the minus 6 per second. So we can completely ignore rotational decays uh, in for the systems under investigations at the time scales that we are interested in. And also these rotational redistribution by black body radiation uh, is, is small, but still not negligible. It's of the order of 10 to the, oh, sorry, it's of the order 10 to the minus 3, oops, 10 to the minus 3 uh, per second uh, at these, uh, for these levels. So that is the orders of magnitude for rotational redistribution. Vibrational redistribution, though, is of the order of 10 to the minus 3 per second. So this is in the region uh, what we are interested in. In particular, if you go to these states, it's even of the order of uh, 1 per second or uh, even larger. Yeah? So this is the typical vibrational redistribution rates at room temperature. So these should be observable. So what we calculated here is now uh, an initial distribution of vibrational states as we would produce it by just letting photo association do its job and the spontaneous emission populating different vibrational states. And then we placed our resonant enhanced multi-photon ionization laser on this particular state, which is a vibrational uh, quantum number equals three state. So and what you see here is the uh, resonance line simulated. And you also see the relative population of the different rotational states. We only populate j equals 0 and j equals 2 just due to the fact that at our temperatures, due to the low mass, relative mass of uh, lithium, we are almost uh, perfectly in the S-wave scattering regime already for these kind of systems. So now we can just let this uh, propagate here. And you see how the population is, of course, decreasing and uh, is uh, raining down due to the spontaneous emission. And what you can also see, there's a significant redistribution of population, uh, rotational population, due to the uh, coupling to the black body radiation. And if you take this these simulation now, you can predict for the J equals 3, sorry, for the V equals 3 state, you can predict that it should rise first for a certain time because it's filled up from population that rains down, and then it, it gets depopulated uh, partly by spontaneous emission, but partly also we had to include trap loss at these kind of time scales of a few seconds. So that's what we were expecting, and you can also see that underlying this, this characteristic curve here is the different uh, dynamics of the different rotational levels. Okay, and so uh, this is just showing again this distribution, so how these different vibrational levels are populated and depopulated due to the coupling to the black body radiation. And of course, if you would uh, be able to wait for, say, 200 uh, seconds, then you would get this characteristic distribution with the major population in the vibration ground state and the rest given by black body radiation. So that's what you would then expect. And indeed, when we measured uh, these uh, things, we indeed saw exactly this kind of dynamic. So here is the whole time after the photo association. This is the iron yield for this vehicle 3 signal. After photo association, you see this characteristic rise for a certain time, typically some seconds. And then you see a decay, which is essentially given by the uh, decay of the state and also partly already contains the contributions of the decay uh, due to the uh, trap loss that we have. Interestingly, um, we can now try to fit several curves on that. So the dotted line would be if we had only a one body decay. Uh, it doesn't fit quite well. Uh, if we also include inelastic molecule collisions, as I told you before, that is something we have to include uh, at the densities that we have, it still doesn't fit so well. And it's still an open question. Actually, Susanne Yelin uh, told me yesterday uh, that they uh, looked uh, at our data and that she uh, uh, thinks that this might be related to some uh, onset of super radiance, uh, even at this low density. So I'm a little bit surprised about that, but uh, that could be, of course, be uh, funny. Uh, these kind of effects. 
So the density is 10 to the 8 to 10 to the minus per cubic centimeter. Yeah. I mean, the wavelength is also very large, but um, yeah, I, I, it's, it was something that I didn't have uh, or I didn't have on my agenda. But Susanne tells me that they did some calculations, and it seems that there's a contribution. It's not a big one, though. But no. Yeah, um, I mean, there we can just rely upon estimations. And uh, the estimations tell that they are negligible. But um, yeah, estimations, not measurements. <laughs> OK, so this is uh, single. This was more or less single particle dynamics. I mean, partly there was already also some introduction of uh, collisions. But now let's go and look at something that goes towards ultra cold chemistry. So now let's look at the measurement of reactions in this, uh, in this system. So the reactions that we are looking for is uh, cesium plus lithium. Cesium can create uh, lithium cesium different vibration states. So we can have uh, vibration distribution. So the energy is released and leads to uh, trap loss with unity probability. And uh, we can have also uh, collisions where, the, uh, where there's an exchange of one of the partners. Exchange collisions. And the question is, uh, is there some universality that one can derived from these kind of collisions. And it's not so far-fetched to think about universality in this context. If you think about the uh, well-known classical capture theory, which goes under the name of Langevin, the theory, then you can see if you assume that the reaction happens with unity probability at short range, and you know the long-range character of your potential uh, with the centrifugal barrier here, you can very easily derive formula for the uh, cross-section for reactions. In the case of the Van der Waals, cross uh, interaction, you have a C6 over the relative energy to the one-third. If you have an I neutral reaction, this goes like the square root of one over the relative energy. So this, the whole dynamics, the cross section, the rate coefficients, they are just determined by the long range character of your interaction, if you assume that everything here happens with unity. So in classical theory, it's well known that the long range physics determines uh, the, the, uh, the reactivity. And uh, you can also then probably anticipate that this similar thing might be true for uh, collisions in the, in the quantum regime. And indeed, this has been pointed out by uh, Paul Julien in these Faraday discussions. And there had been a series of papers. Here's one uh, where they worked this out in more detail. And what it comes out, out of this uh, theory is also that uh, you assume that everything here at short range happens with unity probability. Uh, you call this the chemical forces regime. But uh, if you do this, then you can also derive a general rate a coefficient for these reactions, which then just depends on a characteristic length determined by the potential uh, that you have. So there's a certain kind of universality also in this, in this kind of regime, whatever universality means in this context. But what is important to note here is if you plug in numbers, the typical values that you get for rate coefficients uh, for these kind of uh, inelastic reactions are always of the order of 10 to the minus 10 cubic centimeters per second. So that's somehow the ballpark. This is the order of magnitude. Um, and uh, so we went after uh, to, to study these systems uh, under these conditions. So we did uh, we loaded both uh, uh, atoms into uh, the same dipole trap, and then we did photoassociation, uh, stored the molecules, let them interact with the atoms for a certain amount of time, and then just looked how many molecules were left. And uh, the, as I said already, the nice thing is that the the excitation is uh, actually the only allowed process here for cesium-2. That was the first investigations that we did. And the atoms leave with unity probability. So you can directly derive rate coefficients from just measuring decay curves. So this is a typical measurement here just for cesium-2, cesium-2 without cesium, and this is cesium-2 with cesium. And you see that the decay time gets much, much higher. And from this, you can deduce the rate coefficient by just measuring this molecular loss rate as a function of density. And we had done this, and this is early measurements. This is from 2006, so already six years ago. We had done this for cesium. And we were quite surprised at that time to find that these rate coefficients did not depend at all on the vibration state. But now, I mean, with this universal theory, uh, this makes sense. And again, you see the typical order of magnitude is 10 to the minus 10 here, as expected. And the same as, uh, comes out as the dependence for the different rotation states. At that time, we were still puzzled, but I think now we understand that this is one of the signatures of this general uh, theory that uh, Paul and others uh, developed. Uh, so we went then for the lithium cesium system by doing the photo association and uh, creating now highly vibrational, high vibrational uh, uh, states in order to see these uh, inelastic collisions in the dipole trap. And here you see the same behavior. So this is the molecules uh, uh, without any uh, atoms, but if we store them with the atoms, we see a fast change in the decay. 
decay in the storage time and we can transform this into this rate coefficient and you see again now it's two times 10 to the minus 10. So again uh, we see that it gets a bit boring after a while because you always measure the same number. Yeah? Uh, but uh, on the other hand it's good to see that uh, this seems to be in good uh, uh, here we had no resolution to tell anything about that um, yeah. I wish we had more data on that but this was uh, actually pre post analysis after the experiment had been disassembled and moved to Heidelberg and since then we haven't gotten back to these kind of measurements okay so um, what we can deduce from these measurements is uh, that the typical rate coefficients, as I said already, are of the order of 10 to the minus 10. Uh, this is still larger here than what we would expect from this universal theory. There we would just expect 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 11. But if you look more closely into our data, then you find that we are still not uh, at this unitarity limit here for S-wave collisions. And we have to include P-waves. And if we include P-waves as well into our analysis, this rises the, uh, the, uh, this rate coefficient that we expect by almost a factor of four, and then these numbers seem to be at least in, in, yeah, even in quantitative degree. So uh, for the measurements that we did here at these temperatures, uh, you have a significant contribution of P rate. So the next thing to do would be then to go to lower and lower temperatures to do these kind of investigations. Uh, I just want to mention here that, of course, uh, similar investigations uh, along these lines have also been done by several other groups here. Dave DeMille's result on rubidium cesium plus rubidium. Again, you see here yeah, this is for different vibration states. Uh, uh, you see again the same number, 10 to the minus 10. And also in the, the GILA group did these kind of inelastic collision potassium rubidium plus potassium and rubidium. Again, 1.7 times 10 to the minus 10. So this is, uh, yeah. I don't know if the word universe is a bit too much used. Uh, but this is a, a general trend, let's say. Yeah? OK, so now uh, let's get, go back. How can we increase the density? And uh, this brings me now also to the end of my talk. What we are currently doing is we want to increase the phase space density to get to a higher uh, uh, to, to a regime where we can also study dipolar uh, interactions and also to have a regime where we can study this chemistry uh, in, in more detail. And uh, what we set up for this purpose now in Heidelberg is, is a new setup where we have a double a Zeeman slower here, which fills in uh, a trap like usually. And uh, okay, this is how it looks in the lab, but this always looks the same, uh, at least for the guys that know it. So the two routes that we want to take uh, for the lithium and the cesium, for the cesium, we just follow the, uh, the innsbruck uh approach that we uh, want to uh, trap all, everything in a, an optical dipole trap and then do evaporative cooling, controlling by magnetic fields, controlling the scattering properties of the cesium to get us to uh, to cesium and for uh, lithium, we are following more or less the approach uh, of Zeeland using a uh, optical dipole trap strongly focused and then directly evaporate. And uh, in this approach, we, we hope that we can reach the uh, double degeneracy. Actually, here's some data. We have good atom numbers, 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9, the large loading fluxes. Uh, the phase based density, at least uh, the number that I got yesterday, was 0.1. So I have to check my email today. So it seems that we are uh, pretty close to quantum degeneracy here. And also with the lithium experiment, I think uh, at least if I look at the numbers, uh, for example, the Williams experiment, we are in the same ballpark. So I hope that this summer we will be able to create this double degeneracy system. So what we want to do with this double degeneracy system, the first thing we have to map out is the interactions. Um, there is this review here, which is kind of a nice review. Uh, but uh, it's not very helpful, yeah. I can tell you, because it says nothing about lithium cesium fish markets. So I really have to talk to the authors uh, that they have to write an addendum. Yeah? The problem is, so far, there's nothing known about uh, lithium cesium uh, fish market resonance. So it's a shoot in the dark. Uh, we hope, of course, that we will be as lucky as these Erbium people. Yeah? So find some resonance as two Gauss. Yeah? That would be wonderful. Uh, we were not so sure whether this would actually work, so we better uh, outline or we better design our coil so that it would get us up to 1400 or 1500 Gauss. So let's be on the safe side. And maybe, who knows? Uh, and potassium, uh, uh, sodium, potassium also has turned out that one of the fresh So let's see if lithium cesium has some good surprises. It so far has many bad ones, so let's see whether we have some good ones as well. 
Of course, the first thing uh, we would then like to do, assuming that we get some of these special resonances, if we don't, we probably can still think about confined induced resonances, is uh, to look at Efimov physics. We heard the wonderful introduction uh, by Francesca yesterday. Uh, the interesting thing here, and this has also been mentioned previously in the case of the terbium, is that the scaling of this universal scaling goes to a factor of five, and uh, I hope that this system one can then investigate whether also for these two species systems one finds similar universality uh, in this parameter but also in the, in the uh, three body uh, parameter. So this is one of the first things we hope to be doing then this summer. So let me summarize. So I, I think it's really amazing how much progress has been made in the last years towards uh, ultra cold molecules and I think it's really now very realistic all these perspectives that were proposed so far become realistic also experimentally. I've shown you that uh, we could produce uh, lithium cesium molecules in the raw vibrational ground state by photo association. Uh, I also show to you that there is a significant dynamics, at least at time scales of 10 to 20 seconds, concerning uh, the uh, interaction with block, black body radiation and also with the vacuum field, so spontaneous decay of these vibrational states. Uh, we have observed uh, inelastic atom molecule collisions as precursors for what one would call ultra chemistry. In particular, we found these general rates that are always the same, and we made some first steps towards higher phase space density. So let me give some credit to the people in the world. So this is the Heidelberg team now, Mark Repp, Rico Piers and Joris Ullmann is the PhD students on this project, uh, Roman Müller, Stefan Schmidt, and Christina Meyer did their diploma. And I should also mention that many of the things that I showed here are part of the PhD thesis of Johannes. Johannes is currently uh, a postdoc in the group of Frederick Merck at ETH. So and with this, I would like to stop and thank you for your attention. Uh, I would like to thank Mattia for this very nice talk and to be perfectly in time. And now we, we have time for many questions, almost 10 minutes. Please. Um. So, Matthias, I noticed uh, a lot of the studies that you did were with not V equals zero, but with higher vibrational levels. And my recollection is that for V equals zero specifically, there was some anomalously small formation of J equals zero relative to J equals two. Yes, and all, yeah, enormously small. I think in this case it was pretty much matching uh, the J equals 0 to J equals 2 was in the ratio that we would have expected from the uh, scattering from S-wave scattering. Uh, I see, okay. Uh, but the rate, the total rate was anomalously or maybe anomalously small because uh, of this whole process of spontaneous emission, the amount of molecules that we produce also in the dipole trap was too small to do meaningful investigations, in particular then uh, accounting for RMP detection and so forth. Yeah. So of course what we hope uh, along the lines now is by increasing the phase-based density and then by choosing methods like uh, Feschbach association and steer up to go to uh, decent densities <coughs> so that these things can be done in the vibration ground state. Yeah. Right. Uh, for these whole collisions, I don't expect much of a change. But of course, if you want to go for uh, dipolar gases, things like that, it's, it's a must. Uh, right, so at this point, do you have some sort of quantitative understanding of why the formation rates are, are so different in the photo association step? So I, I presume the, the decays, the Frank Conans, there can't be anything going on there. But in the, in the photo association step, do you understand yeah, why? There's one, there's one open question that we still don't understand too well. Uh, that is the fact that we saw this photo association at all, because we had a we it, it, we started from a, a triplet and we went down to the signal singlet. So there must have been some singlet triplet mixing, and the singlet triplet mixing, how it occurred exactly, is still not known. Uh, so uh, the rates are that we measured, or the the uh, triplet admixture that we measured was far too high. So this was in this case, this was something that was really anomalous. Uh, and this is something we still don't understand, but the best uh, assumption currently is that it's due to some molecular coupling in the excited state uh, that so far nobody has worked out in detail. We can be sure that we have this thing, the triplet mix mixing, because by the photo association we could map out the wave function uh, of the ground state that we actually mainly address, and it turned out it was indeed the singlet wave function that was mainly contributing to the photo association just by the node structure. We could map this out. Uh, the only thing we don't understand so far is the coupling mechanism in the excited state. 
this is something that will come back on the agenda once we think about steer up and things like <coughs> that. Other question? Comment? Uh, Matthias, uh, it's not quite clear to me what is the strategy for uh, cooling down to double the general C, the cesium lithium. Can you yeah, so tell me more? Uh, currently, we have several plans A, B, C, up to uh, uh, Z. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the, uh, the first thing is uh, let's get the degeneracy for uh, each species independently. Uh, there, we just follow <coughs> a, a known path so far. Not so well known path. Um, Okay, we are recorded, therefore I'm not going to make any statements that I regret afterwards. I tell you in the break why there are some of the paths uh, are not so uh, reliable, uh, but I'm not talking about the Innsbruck path. This is very reliable. Also, the Zeeland path is very reliable, but there's other people that did cesium. There are some uh, literature is not so consistent. Um, the, uh, this is the first thing. Then the question is how do we bring them together? There's two options. One is to rely upon sympathetic cooling. Uh, we once did sympathetic cooling with cesium and lithium, but it was lithium-7. That worked amazingly well. It turned out that we, from these early measurements, which is already more, almost 10 years ago, we, de we had a, we had a, uh, we were almost unitarity limited, uh, even at temperatures of, of 15 microkelvin, which pointed at a rather large... By uh, at, what, <laughs> uh, at what field was this? At, no field. at zero field. Zero field. So uh, for lithium-6, we don't know what's going to happen. And then we have to, yeah, then we have to fiddle around. I think we have to go the same kind of uh, different paths that other groups went. Uh, Christoph can tell a little bit about it, and he's probably going to tell about it, uh, how to bring both together. And the mass, there's a big problem here with the mass in mass difference, lithium cesium. So one of the things we are currently setting up is a, is a magic wavelength trap so that we can independently uh, manipulate the two species. Good luck. Thanks. <laughs> you want to come join? <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Other questions? So I have myself a comment, maybe, and also questions. So the comment is, um, so it will be really great uh, if you go to this FMO physics with this very small scaling factor, because actually uh, two consecutive FMO resonance uh, at the end have never been measured. So it's not only, I mean, it's really, can be really, eh? Sorry? <coughs> No, but uh, I think that now the, the, the author itself uh, agree. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think at least I'm uh, not in a clear way, let's put it in this way. And, uh, and this will be, will be really great because you can then really test in the negative side that the scaling factor because the positive side, as we heard yesterday, have some, uh, I mean, bring in more problems. And the question is, um, once you get um, uh, ground state dipolar molecules, so what, what will be the first uh, experiment you will devise? I mean, uh, with this, uh, of course, the first thing that you will see is uh, is, is big uh, dipolar losses. Uh, hopefully, yeah, if you have if you have uh, uh, if you reach this regime, of course. I mean, I, I took all this transparency. Uh, this uh, lithium cesium combination is chemically unstable, so the first thing you have to do is put it in lower dimensional structures, things like that. But of course, the first thing that you hope to see is kind of uh, uh, dipolar decays. Uh, the next thing then would, would be interesting is indeed to go into a regime where you put the things into lattices and look for long range interactions over more than one or two lattice sites. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you that I, I hope that soon we will be. Nature is nice, and fresh bar resonances are broad. Uh, then uh, the FMO physics will be the first thing to investigate. And I guess that is something that will keep us busy then for quite a while. Really enter this vision. Okay. If, we, if there are no further questions, I think.